Hey everybody, this is Dr. Josh Funk here with another episode of the Strength and Knowledge Podcast. I'm very, very excited to bring to you this next guest. Um, for those of you that know me, know I've been interacting a little bit more on Twitter over the course of the uh, COVID year, as I like to call it, but just spending more time interacting with professionals uh, on that medium. And I have been able to interact with somebody who uh, is a faculty member at the University of Miami that is a school that we have a lot of interns that have come through our pipeline here at Rehab to Perform. And he's also heavily involved in the APTA, but um, I'm excited to bring to you today, Dr. Greg Hartley. Welcome, Greg. Thanks, Josh. I'm excited to be here. Well, hey, let's dive right into it. I mean, I think what we try to start off each podcast with is really just providing a little bit of perspective to some of the young you know, either SPTs or PTs out there on, on what people's uh, early trajectory into the profession look like. So how did you find PT? You know, that's um, uh, a good question. I started out probably uh, like a lot of folks, knowing that I wanted to work in a caring profession, um, mainly a healthcare profession. Um, I had a couple of physicians in my family and I was just really starting out pre-med and following their footsteps and just doing what I thought was expected really. Um, I didn't know anything about physical therapy. In fact, I don't think I had ever heard of it. This would have been back around 1985 or so. Um, then my grandmother got uh, injured really seriously in, a, in an accident, a car accident, and, um, and needed to go to physical therapy. I went home from college uh, one summer to take care of her because she was in a wheelchair at that time. And it turned out I had to drive her back and forth to physical therapy. And that was really my first exposure to it. And that's when I discovered that uh, that was what I wanted to do. Uh, and so I went back to college, um, switched from pre-med to pre-PT, um, and um, started applying to PT schools at that point. So um, yeah, it was just serendipitous and, um, you know, just because I, I had some exposure to it, probably like a lot of folks, uh, really either from a family member or from your own personal injuries, sometimes that's how folks first get exposed to PT. So not different, really. Yeah, I can share a similar story. Just for me, I was pre-med. I was a bio major. I had just got done organic chemistries, biochem 511, which still sticks out in my head. And then I got injured myself. So that was my foray into the world of, of PT. Um, you know, drastically changed as, as you mentioned, went into pre-PT. But mm -hmm. for you, you not only jumped head on into this profession, but you've invested yourself heavily and the educational side, not just with uh, Miami, but also getting more involved on the uh, APTA level. At what point did you transition from clinician role to more of that uh, educator and somebody that was going to be involved in the big picture level of the profession? Wow, that's an interesting question because I don't think I've ever thought of it in that perspective before. Um, I'll, I'll just sort of tell you, I guess, about my own evolution. When I, when I first graduated, like, like almost everybody, I was a clinician and, and just pure clinician. Um, I, I kind of quickly moved up into some leadership positions within, I, at the time I was working at the VA. And so I, I worked at two different VAs and, and kind of worked my way up into leadership positions there. Um, still 100% clinical, but always involved in clinical education and enjoyed teaching students uh, as interns in the clinic. Uh, later, I moved to a different position uh, that was much more management focused and administrative focused, um, where I had an opportunity to really be more involved with student education, um, at least in terms of managing their experiences in a large practice. And, and that happened in a home health environment. And then something just struck me and I decided that I wanted to uh, go back to school. And uh, at the time I had a master's and so I was uh, interested in getting a doctorate. And so um, I moved back to Miami. And when I came back to Miami, I uh, ended up in a, a, a unique position where 
I was in a clinical environment funded partly by the clinic and, and funded partly by the University of Miami, where my role was to serve as a clinician who managed and supervised up to 10 students at a time. So it was kind of a 10 to one CI model. Um, and that was really a, an experiment. Uh, it wasn't that sustainable, but it was super interesting. I learned a lot about academia, a lot about clinical teaching, um, and also that these two to one and three to one and five to one models can actually work quite well in, in clinical training. Uh, so that got me more interested into uh, academia and teaching as well. And then uh, UM hired me as, as an adjunct to teach uh, geriatrics, which is my area of clinical specialty. So I started teaching a geriatrics course in their DPT curriculum uh, while I was still working full time at the, um, the clinic where I was employed. And it wasn't until 2015, so just five years ago, that I uh, joined the UM faculty full time, uh, doing now 100% um, teaching uh, and academic stuff. Um, so that's kind of the trajectory of my clinical practice and, and how I moved into academia. Now, in terms of leadership with APTA, I had awesome role models when I was a PT student um, here at the University of Miami, and they were always very um, supportive and role modeled um, act active membership in APTA, which I, I think faculty here still do, or at least we try to do. Uh, and so I had always been a member of APTA. I almost felt a professional duty to be a member uh, an obligation to be a part of the only association that advocates on behalf of the profession at any level, really. Uh, and so I remained a member. I got involved in this, what was the section on geriatrics um, once I realized that that was where my clinical interest lied. Uh, and it was that section involvement, or now it's an academy. So um, the academy involvement that really gave me those connections with people who had similar interests. And then I found opportunities to kind of navigate my way through the section in leadership and volunteer opportunities, starting out small, doing things on the practice committee or doing things in the education committee or whatever it might be. Um, and then found myself um, being nominated to run for the board of directors and ended up doing several different things within the academy. And obviously now I, I serve as president of the Academy of Geriatric Physical Therapy. Uh, and so I've had that kind of involvement within the academy and section, which is where most of my leadership has been. Um, but that has afforded me many opportunities to be involved with other APTA initiatives, including something that I'm really involved a lot with now is an education leadership partnership, which is um, sort of this tri-alliance between the APTA and ACAP, which is the Association of PT Schools, and, um, and APTE, so the Academy of Physical Therapy Education, those three entities really looking at um, physical therapist education across the continuum. And so I've been involved in that mostly because of my role in the Academy of Geriatrics and also because of my interest in uh, residency education and some, some opportunities that I had had along the way. And to piggyback on that, I mean, one of the things I know you're very passionate about is changing current standards, um, doing things to change structure, uh, potentially change the deliverables and the overall path to expertise within the profession. If you had to pick just a couple points and areas in which you'd say you're focusing on the most, what would they be? So right now, um, I'm spending a lot of time really thinking about and writing about and trying to uh, research alternative models of education and training for the physical therapist. This is a huge conversation that's happening in the profession and it's it couldn't come at a better time. Um, and, and I think that, you know, in, in the midst of this pandemic, we have been forced 
to like it or not change how we do everything including teach um, and post pandemic whatever that looks like i just don't think it's ever going to look like it looked before and it will be different somehow so i'm i'm encouraged by that and i also think that we need to take this time to really rethink how how we delivered education to physical therapists now people have been saying this going way back to helen hislop and her macmillan lecture in 1975 so this conversation has been going on a long time about how uh, we really need to look at the overall uh, trajectory of how we educate physical therapists and in the 20 20s now, uh, really in the 2010s, uh, we began to see sort of a, a bigger conversation around the return on investment for physical therapist education. And, uh, and was it worth it? Because it is uh, very expensive. It's a seven year degree. Yes, we end up with a doctoral degree, um, but then the income related to what we spend on our education wasn't keeping pace. Uh, and so there have been a lot of conversations around how do we reimagine what physical therapist training might look like so that the return on investment uh, is good enough that we continue to attract people to this wonderful profession and not potentially lose them to other professions uh, where they see a higher return on that investment. So this conversation is a serious one and one that's been going on now for many, many years. And I think there is an opportunity within our profession and external to our profession. There's many barriers to this, but I'll give you kind of an idealist version of where I think we might could go. So I think we could shorten DPT education. Um, I don't think that it has to be three years. I think we could do it in less time. Certainly we could do it in two and a half. We might could do it in two. Um, and that would include the clinical training time. So I'm suggesting that a lot of didactics could be cut down or reduced. Uh, clinical training time could be uh, lowered to the minimum that CAPTI allows, even the, the minimum CAPTI allows now, given that they've reduced the standards related to a pandemic. Um, and so that reduces some of the tuition burden on students. Now, there are schools that are already doing this. There are hybrid education programs around. A couple or three of them come to mind right away. Um, so this isn't completely crazy, crazy talk. Um, it is doable and is already happening. However, I think that if we are, if we talk about reducing the length of time for DPT education, then there must be an expectation that after entry-level education, there is a required post-professional phase of education. And it has to be a required phase. We can't simply reduce the DPT from three years to two years, for example, and then say you have all the same practice privileges that you would have now. Practice has evolved and changed for the better for physical therapists and for patients. And by that, I mean that as doctors of physical therapy, we practice autonomously without the need for referral, without the need for physician oversight, practicing and growing primary care environments where in many states now we can order imaging. Uh, and so we continue to expand our practice privileges but in the entry level environment, I think, you know, there's, there's a, uh, in my mind, I think we, we have to agree that we can't produce a graduate that knows everything about everything because of just the volume of information that is spewed at us these days. I mean, your area is ortho and sports. My area is geriatrics. I know stuff about Jerry that you don't know. You know stuff about ortho and sports that I don't know. And that's fine. But to keep up in all those areas, imagine if you and I also had to keep up in pediatrics and oncology and pelvic health, all that stuff, 
There's just no way. So I think entry-level education needs to recognize that it's producing a basic generalist, very basic. And then we move into a, uh, a more specialized area of practice. And maybe it's ortho, maybe it's sports, maybe it's peds, jerry, oncology, whatever it might be. And, and I do think there would have to be an area of specialty practice that is the equivalent of general generalist. So you would have a GP or a primary care. You know, in medicine, they have this. They have internal medicine. They have family practice. Um, they have primary care physicians. They have specialty areas that are the specialist generalist, if, if that's a thing. So I think we would have to get to that point in physical therapy where we have an area of specialty practice that is kind of primary care or general GP, general practice or family practice, whatever we call it. But folks would then move from entry level sort of basic generalist to a specialty area of practice where they dive in deeper. And I would suggest they do a, a, a residency so that they then finish the residency in a year or so, having spent an immersive uh, time in practice, learning about really fine tuning that area of specialty practice so that, stay with me for a minute, so that if we've reduced entry level education by let's say a year, or at least eight months, but then we add a year or eight or 10 months of residency training, the total time isn't different. However, as a resident, you're generally making an income. You're not paying tuition. Now there are some residency models that do charge tuition, but they often pay the resident a higher salary, so it's affordable. But my point is, the, the cost of training is lower for the learner, whoever the learner is, the total cost of training is less. And at the end, you have a therapist who is trained as this basic generalist, but also has now gotten a tremendous amount of experience training and is ready to practice right at, at the end, ready to go as a highly skilled, specialist in an area of specialty practice, where ideally they would become board certified in that area of specialty practice, and then continue the development of lifelong learning, because I mean, that's really, frankly, just the beginning. I mean, the learning never stops. It, it's it's your, your entire career. But that kind of trajectory, in my opinion, is kind of what we owe to society. We really need to produce clinicians who are capable of practicing at the top of their license. And that means if you are a doctor of physical therapy, then you're practicing and you're, and you're behaving like a doctor of physical therapy and you're practicing evidence-based practice, and you know how to really function as an expert, hopefully as an expert, within your area of specialty practice. The, you know, there's a lot of research that says expertise is not time dependent. So gaining years of experience doesn't make one an expert. You could be, I graduated from PT school in 1990. That makes me 30 years out of PT school. So I could have been a physical therapist with one year of experience times 30. So I would still be practicing like a new grad 30 times over, right? Or I could have continued learning and growing and developing and hopefully become an expert in an area of practice. But the point is time alone doesn't make an expert. It's really learning how to reflect on your practice. And those are the kinds of things that are taught in the context of the clinical practice environment where residency education occurs. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's ways to do this. There's a tremendous amount of barriers uh, in, in place um, for, in order for that to happen. 
namely um, a staged licensure process, because I think if we're going to mandate post-professional residency, then there would have to be a staged license process so that you would have a, some sort of a license that would allow you to enter residency, but it would be restricted. Otherwise, you couldn't enforce it. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot to think about and many, many years down the road, probably before anything like that could happen, but I'm excited by it. So many different things come to mind. I mean, just hearing about uh, kind of circumventing this uh, ROI discussion, right? Where, okay, I'm going to spend the same amount of time, but I'm going to actually develop more expertise and have less potential debt things that are continually uh, areas of conversation for young people. I was also okay. thinking about a recent Twitter dialogue about people wondering whether or not we should bring the bottom up of the profession or take the top higher. And I almost feel like this accomplishes both. You're setting a, 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 a better just minimum standard because you created this person who's, okay, two years, we went a mile wide. And then in the same amount of time, we started to go a mile deep in this yeah. direction. So yeah. you, you, brought the, you, you brought the bottom up with just that three-year period that they have to invest in. Uh, and then you probably created somebody that might have been forced into a specialty that hopefully found some kind of a passion. And then like you said, continually chose to, to <clears throat> reinvest, right? Each year, right. when I look at like education, formal and informal, they're both great, recognizing the value of both, but they are, they're they're reinvestments, right? When we think of return on investment, right? right? Your return on investment, <clears throat> right? Is, is you deciding, uh, okay, initially it's finances, all right? I'm putting finances in and I'm going to get something back. But right. when we get to post-professional education after a residency, even after a fellowship, I think sometimes the things that people have a question about is, is this worth it? What are some things or some trends that you've seen or things that need to get addressed to make a higher level of expertise, and I put in quotes, worth it? Yeah. Um, and people are obviously talking about reimbursement a lot, but what else? <clears throat> Good. So there are, <clears throat> there's actually a couple of papers out on this topic. Um, and, and one that was published by Briggs et al. last year around what employers value in residency graduates. <clears throat> so it turns out employers notice a difference between uh, a resident and a, a experience matched non-resident. So same number of years of experience, one just did a residency and one didn't. Um, and employers notice a difference in patient satisfaction, they notice a difference in patient outcome, they notice a difference in patient treatment, um, and they notice a difference in leadership qualities, um, a lot of different things. So uh, employers do value it and see a difference. And what we are beginning to see, and this research is still preliminary, but what we're beginning to see is that people are paying for that, meaning that employers are beginning to reward people who have board certifications. Um, so uh, we, we were sort of a long time getting there uh, to the point where it was recognized that these individuals bring skills to the table that maybe somebody else might not. And, uh, and so we're beginning to see employers who pay a premium for that. Now, it's not like your salary is doubled but it's something, right? Uh, it's a little bit more money uh, if you have achieved board certification, which is easy to do, have, uh, easier to do if you uh, complete a residency, for example. So that, that's just sort of one direct benefit. What I think happens though more often than not are the indirect benefits, which is folks that complete a residency develop not only great patient management skills, but also really good leadership skills. And often what happens with those individuals is either they have the skills to become a, a world-class entrepreneur and can open and manage their own practices and know how to market themselves well, and that has its own financial rewards. If, however, they work in an employer-employee relationship, 
the employers, as I mentioned earlier, notice differences. They see differences between these individuals and those that haven't done residency or board certification. So what happens? Well, opportunities knock. Employers go to these individuals that are board certified and say, hey, we have an opportunity for you to be a manager in this area, or we'd like for you to build our uh, total joint recovery program, or we'd like for you to manage our student education pro program, or we'd like for you to do X, Y, or Z. So opportunities begin to present themselves to these individuals that might not have been presented otherwise. And then the person, of course, has the choice, so you can either take advantage of it or not. But typically, if you take advantage of these um, opportunities, they bring with them additional money. Um, so there are promotional opportunities, increased responsibilities, and hopefully increased dollars that come as a result of that. Now, in medicine, it's a little bit different because in medicine, specialists are reimbursed at a different rate than primary care providers are. And I don't see a day where that is gonna happen in physical therapy um, in, in the near future. Um, I think we will continue to be reimbursed at the same rate. So where I see the, um, the salary difference, if you're just talking about the black bottom dollar, you know, the black and white of that, um, then I think it's just these uh, increased managerial and administrative opportunities or practice ownership or practice partnership opportunities that might come from that kind of, of environment. Yeah, and sometimes I think board certification, it's, it's marketable, it's, dare I say, a little bit salesy. And when mm -hmm. somebody comes into an operation and they hear that they're working with somebody that's board certified, yeah. they might be more likely to buy into a plan of care. <clears throat> we talk a lot about churn, right? Churn, churn rate, right? People leaving a PT plan of care, they might be less likely to leave that plan of care as a result of three letters, right? Whatever that letter, yeah, yeah, C, yeah. S, okay. right? For you, G, C, S. We have some right. people on our staff who are sports board certified. I've got some people that are uh, applying for orthopedic certification as well. But um, right. yeah, I mean, that extra little layer sometimes is, is all that it takes. Would you agree? Yeah, for sure. It's, um, it's very marketable. I, I know when we began our residency program where I used to work as a clinician, we started what was at the time the first um, geriatric residency in the country. And just by virtue of the fact that we had a residency training program at that clinical site, our outpatient volume doubled in 12 months. Um, now that is partly, at least partly attributed to the residency program because physicians get it. They understand that they know what residency education is. They understand what it's for and they value the fact that that level of education and training was happening at that site. And so we saw a huge increase in referrals from physicians just because we had residents. Now, over time, um, we were the first geriatric residency in the country. Over time, we hired a lot of those people. And then in turn, in a matter of years, we had 10 or 15 board certified geriatric specialists on staff. And that, of course, attracted a lot of referrals but also attracted a lot of people directly to the clinic who, who understood that they were seeing a board certified specialist. So absolutely, yes, it, it matters to the public. It matters to physicians who, I know we can see patients without referral, but in, we still take referrals. So, um, so physicians get it and they understand and when they, when they figure out that you have a residency or that you've been residency trained, um, they understand that and they value it. And it had a direct impact on our referrals. I agree with you. And I think for us, outside of just the referral side of things and the patient plan of care, I, I, I can tell you 
quite honestly, that ever since starting up our residency program, we've had people who are seeking employment who mention it. They view us differently. Um, Evidence-based practice, some of these other buzzwords that kind of go hand in hand with clinical excellence are things that they mention and, and, and communicate that they value. Uh, if we go into the residency side of things where we have our first resident, we ideally will be going through that checklist, make sure that we're accredited at the end of the first year. What recommendations do you have for people maybe who are out there who are either going to explore residency or are in a position where maybe that they can start a residency uh, at their place of business? Good. Um, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I think my advice for, um, for you or for anybody that might be interested in starting a residency <clears throat> to train future board certified specialists is first off, remember that a residency program is or hopefully will be an accredited post-professional educational program. So just like CAPD accredits professional programs, PT schools, ABPTRFE accredits post-professional schools or training programs. Now, those training programs can be housed in an academic institution like the University of Miami. We have six residency programs uh, affiliated with us. Um, or they can be housed in a clinical entity like yours. Um, an example of that would be Cleveland Clinic, right? That's a clinical entity and they have residency programs. That's not a school, it's, it's a clinical entity. Um, so you would have um, that kind of a model where it's clinically based. But understand that you're still building and accrediting a post-professional educational program. It is not the same as a glorified clinical internship. That is not what it is. It is an investment in the pedagogy and the didactic content that goes along with the clinical training. So it's delivery of both a didactic curriculum and a clinical curriculum. Now in PT school, the didactic curriculum is heavy because you have to have the knowledge. The clinical curriculum is what the minimum is about 30 weeks, I think, uh, for, for CAPD. Um, so all in all, the didactic portion of PT school is very heavy, the clinical portion less heavy, right? In residency education, it's the opposite, right? The clinical part of it is super heavy. Eight, 1,500 hours out of 1,800 minimum have to be direct patient care. And then 300 hours out of 1,800 have to be didactic. So there is still class time, there's still lectures, there's still uh, exams and, and um, assessments that happen throughout the learning process. So for anybody interested in developing a residency, um, approach it in the sense that you are creating a post-professional program, educational program, and that's heavily focused on clinical training but it has to be integrated with a didactic curriculum. And so your focus really is on uh, learner development um, through the continuum of that year within your specialty area of practice, ortho, sports, whatever it might be. Um, but don't approach this as though it is um, the same as having a student because it isn't. It's a much bigger investment in terms of time uh, and commitment. So that would be my advice for those uh, wanting to develop a residency. For students who might be, or, or early career professionals who might be considering going to a residency, I would say first, um, make sure that you are um, in love with the specialty that you've chosen, that you um, believe that that is where you wanna practice uh, it is a, a, a significant investment of time, a year, for you to train to become board certified within a specialty area of practice. Now with that, can people 
be wrong about it? Sure. I mean, you can enter pediatrics and then find out, you know, two years later that that's not the specialty that you really love and maybe you want to do something different. That's okay. You can always change. There's no reason you can't. But one thing in physical therapy that's different from medicine is that our specialty areas of practice are not restrictive, which just means I'm a board certified geriatric clinical specialist, but legally I can still treat children. So there's no legal barrier that would prevent me from treating a referral that came to my clinic for a 12 year old. Just because I'm board certified in geriatrics doesn't mean I can't treat those patients. As long as I have the personal competence to do it, um, then I could legally do it. That's not true in medicine. I don't think you want your pediatrician also doing your open heart surgery. So there, it's very different in medicine. So in physical therapy, we have a little bit more freedom to cross specialty areas, particularly like between ortho and sports and some of the other ones. Um, so yeah, I would say make sure you're in love with your specialty. Make sure uh, students um, or early career professionals who are interested, make sure that you're looking for um, residency programs that are accredited or going for accreditation. Because I think that is a, an important criteria. First off, it tells you that you, know, you should know what you're getting if you're entering a program that you're going to commit a year of your life to, um, to making a sacrifice uh, of some sort to complete. You need to sort of know what you're signing up for. Accreditation sets a bar, so you know that they're meeting at least the minimal criteria for accreditation. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing accreditation does for the participant is that if you graduate from an accredited program, you're automatically eligible to sit for the board exam. You don't have to do anything else. You just show them that you graduated and boom, you're in. Uh, so you're automatically eligible to sit for that exam. You don't have to prove anything else. You just show them you graduated and you're in at least to sit for the exam. Uh, the other piece of good news for the potential candidates is that if you complete a residency, chances are you will succeed on the board exam uh, at a much higher pass rate than people who don't do residency. So it turns out that there's anywhere from a five to 20% difference in some specialty areas between people who have uh, completed a residency versus those who have not completed a residency in terms of pass rate on the national board exams. So for, for specialty exams. So uh, there's a big difference. So it, those who complete residency by far have a much higher pass rate on the specialty board exams than people who don't. So, uh, so there's a lot of good things to say about that. And I would just tell people to investigate, use the resources available on, on ABPTRFE's website uh, to look at programs, make sure their uh, curriculum is kind of what you're looking for. And I would also say sometimes students um, choose residency programs because of where they're located, because they wanna live in San Diego or they wanna live in Manhattan or wherever that might be. Um, and I would just say, you know, don't, don't make a decision based just on that. Um, particularly as a young professional who may not have a lot of commitments at that point in their life, um, and maybe, you know, some people certainly do, but, uh, but some, a lot of people don't. And, and you, can, you can live anywhere for a year. Um, it's only a year. And uh, go to the program that is right for you. That is, uh, because you are going to be invested in this program heavily. And um, where you live for those 12 months is going to be far less important than what you get out of the program. And then at the end of that program, of course, you can go live in San Diego or Manhattan or wherever you want to go live. Um, but I would say don't make a decision for a residency program based solely on where it's located. I agree. And you made me think very, very briefly about some college houses that I lived in for a year that um, certainly probably don't meet the minimum standards for, for a lot of people. But <laughs> right. um, 
going back just to the residency thing and why I think it's been amazing for us is we also have high school interns and undergraduate interns, Mm -hmm. as well as new hires that have all benefited from the time we spent putting into preparing the residency. And I think one of the things that um, I've always had challenges with is discussion surrounding a CI to student ratio that involved a CI with more than one person. Uh, I know Greg has certain thoughts surrounding ways to make this work. And I'm not necessarily challenging him and saying that it can't work, but I'm just saying that I have not had enough people communicate to me uh, a more strategic way to make it work. So Greg, I'll just kind of give you the floor. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Josh. Um, I think maybe where we left off was, was something related to having residents and students and, and also uh, board certified specialists and other learners um, learning together. And there's quite a body of research and literature on this topic. And in, in medicine, they call this layered learning where you have, everybody's kind of familiar with the attending physician and the senior resident and the junior resident and then medical students. Uh, so there's sort of this, uh, for lack of a better metaphor, a food chain uh, that, that goes uh, with, with medical education. In physical therapy education, we don't have anything formal in, in terms of that. But this idea of layered learning where you have um, a physical therapist, let's say you, Josh, as the attending PT, um, and you are instructing and teaching a resident in orthopedics or sports physical therapy. And that resident may in turn also be working with a physical therapist student or maybe in a, even a physical therapist assistant student. Um, and so there could be this layered effect to the learning. And there is tremendous knowledge that can be gained that way and also a huge efficiency that can be gained that way. Um, So that's one concept of layered learning. Another concept that's often written about in the literature, particularly from medicine again, because they have, you know, a century's worth of history doing this, uh, more than that actually, Um, they call this near peer education. So N-E-A-R-P-E-E-R, near peer uh, education. And that's where you have senior residents teaching junior residents or where you have fellows helping to teach residents or where you have residents helping to teach students. And those are called near peers, people that are close to you that are going to be your peer, your colleague, but they are helping to coach and helping to mentor uh, early professionals, young professionals and residents or students alike. So I just wanted to throw those two concepts out there if uh, your listeners are interested in learning more about that kind of food chain. Again, not not the best metaphor, but the only one I can think of right now. Um, Then they can certainly sort of Google search for layered learning or near peer education and find more on that topic. To directly and more directly answer your question about Uh, CI to student ratios in physical therapy. Again, I would point folks to the evidence. Um, There's anecdotal stories about this working very well. And then there are, of course, anecdotal stories about this being a complete failure. Um, I would just say those are mostly anecdotal stories. So when you turn to the evidence, there's actually a fair amount of studies now that have been published on two to one models specifically that show they are very effective, um, that they do not impede or lower productivity, and in fact can have the opposite effect in most cases um, of having students um, in terms of measuring productivity, um, particularly on terminal clinical internships. So let me give you my experience. I'm gonna, we'll go back all the way to the beginning where we started this morning, where I talked about when I first um, moved back to Miami after a decade of practice and one of my first um, jobs down here um, in South Florida was this 10 to one model, right? Where it was me being a CI and I had 10 students uh, with me. 
And that was a, a very unique sort of experimental position, which I found thrilling. I will say that the job of the CI in that kind of a model, which is more of a preceptor model than, than a, a, a typical CI model, is uh, very labor intensive in terms of the academic preparation side so that the, the CI really is a teacher and coordinates small group discussion, coordinates case presentations at the end of the day, uh, coordinates a lot of the peer to peer education that happens between the students with each other um, over patients uh, and at the end of the day because we, we would do like rounds at the end of the day. Uh, so that's a, a very unique and uncommon model. That's 10 to one thing. Two to one is more common and two to one I am actually a proponent of. I think if you are a very strong CI and you have a lot to offer. Um, managing two students at a time is actually a whole lot of fun, particularly having two students can, can help a little bit with managing the, the logistics of the schedule um, and then it might be able to free up a little bit of time at the end of the day where uh, the CI can coordinate essentially a debriefing time so that at the end of the day, there is a debrief with both students, ideally debriefing with the CI together and using that time constructively to talk about what went well today. Uh, what did I learn today? Having the students share that with each other uh, really reflecting on the day's activities, planning for what they need to go home and read that night so they'll be better prepared for tomorrow. Learning and, and sort of going back and forth with each other in this debriefing time at the end of the day is essential. And in my experience, the students who have participated in that kind of interaction with another student have valued it tremendously, particularly when the students are from different programs. Um, that seems to work even better um, because they're learning things from uh, students that were taught perhaps a little bit differently uh, and they tend to integrate that really well and appreciate it very much. So it can be logistically a challenge uh, to sort of figure out the scheduling pieces of it, the productivity pieces of it, the financial pieces, of, of how to make it work, but it can be done. And when you have a strong CI that is committed to educating the learner, the, the two student interns that are there, um, and they, they use each other to feed off of so that the CI develops activities like debriefing or case presentations at the end of the day. What was the most interesting thing you did today? What was the hardest thing you did today? What can we do to fix that? How can we make it easier for you tomorrow? Um, having those kinds of conversations, almost like rounds or debriefing at the end of the day, um, tends to be really, really useful. And, and in a situation where it's two students and one CI, having the students bounce off of each other in that setting works really, really well. So I just think we should take advantage of our strengths, our really strong CIs, our really good clinics and the clinics that are strong clinics that the schools fight over to get our students placed there. Uh, you know, we want students to go uh, see Josh. And, and so, gee, let's have Josh take two students instead of one. So if we can sort of use these models to help increase the availability of student internships in strong clinical sites that partner well with universities and understand that university's curriculum. It's not just about putting a student out there and a university throwing a student to a clinic, putting our hands over our eyes, crossing our fingers, and hoping that student comes back having learned something. That's not how it should be it should be a much better controlled partnership between the clinic and the university where the clinic understands what the student is coming in knowing and also understands what the goals are for graduation. Like what is the student really expected to be doing? What do they know? What am I supposed to teach them? And how does that integrate with what they've already been taught at your university? Those are the kind of clinical partners that academic institutions are looking for. 
And when they find good ones, they would, they would really very much like to leverage that and use them a lot. So two to one, three to one models, um, even four to one models, I think can work. It's just not a model that physical therapists are accustomed to. It is the model that medicine uses all the time. It's the model that nursing uses all the time. We are the only, at us and OT and speech, the rehab disciplines are pretty much the only healthcare professions that educate students one-on-one. -on -one. Virtually all the others do different models of education. Virtually. I had no idea. Yep. I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, we're, that's we're uh, the only dude, ones. Sure. And somehow we think it's the only way it can be done and nobody else does it this way. No. And I mean, you know, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, like, and we had a conversation a little bit before we got on this morning, but like, we're going to get forced into having more overlaps than we've ever had as yeah. a result of the universities coming to us and saying, Hey, we need this person to do two to three weeks more. Their other internship got canceled or, yeah. Hey, this person who, you know, wasn't originally able to be with you here now needs to come here. And we're trying to just move the chess pieces around and we're sitting here just trying to figure out. And Jamie is, is working with me on making sure that we've got the schedule taken care of, but yeah. how we're structuring overlap, which, physical therapists are getting this overlap time. Who's ready to handle this to ensure not only does that student have a really, really good experience, but that it doesn't negatively affect patient care, which is another exactly. big thing, um, you know, that, that you didn't necessarily mention. I know that it's a priority still, um, but trying to find a way to put as much quality into both of those respective uh, interactions. And then, also make sure that we're not just bringing two students in. And unfortunately I do hear this sometimes where, all right, hey, let's give both a full caseload and the yeah. CI just kind of sits back and there's not as much teaching going on. So right. figuring out that what that balance is, I think a lot of this, honestly, I mean, I, I don't know how the other professions do it, but it's like onboarding. Like how can we more seamlessly do onboarding um, yeah. to allow somebody to step in, so to mm -hmm. speak, easier that requires less time and attention from the CI and allows them to handle more of the day-to-day -day that you mentioned. Yeah, that whole onboarding process has just become so burdensome for clinics. Um, I mean, besides, you know, especially at large acute medical centers, there seem to be days and days and hours and hours of classes and training and orientation and all this stuff that they have to go through. And I know that um, it's not a small amount, even at, at small outpatient clinics, there's still a lot that has to be done to dot your I's and cross your T's for compliance purposes. And that does take a lot of time. And, you know, maybe there's a way to even have students that are already in the clinic be the ones that help orient new students that come in. I know some residency programs are doing that so that they're intentionally overlapping the incoming class with the outgoing class and they use the outgoing class to orient the incoming class. Um, and so there may be some creative ways to even do that in physical therapist student education too. I think you're right about uh, some clinics not necessarily providing the right kind of supervision to students and some clinics perhaps doing it for the wrong motivations. Um, and I think academic partners are looking for high quality clinical partners. For too long, the clinical partner role has been undervalued by academic institutions. Academic institutions have lived in their ivory towers and thinking, well, well, we teach everybody everything they need to know and we just need to get these 32 weeks or 30 weeks or whatever it is of clinical training behind them. Um, and again, because of the one-to-one -one model, it has been really difficult to find high quality, really good clinical partners where we know we're sending students out and that they will come back to the school having learned a lot and having had a great experience. But that's not always the case. Um, so this partnership between the clinic and the academy 
has got to strengthen and the partnership goes both ways. It can't just be the academy being the accountable person. It has to be the clinic. The clinic has to have skin in the game. Uh, and the academy then has to let go of some of that and allow the, the clinic to have that amount of responsibility and to take ownership of some of the uh, progress of the student, but also some of the consequences when a student doesn't perform at the level that they're supposed to perform at. The CI needs to carry, I think, a lot more weight in that decision. And they currently don't. So I think clinical partners need to really see themselves as that, a partner, and, and not just somewhere that uh, a school is placing a student for the next eight weeks. Ideally, it would be a much more integrated partnership and, and one in which the CI plays an integral role in making sure that the student is progressing along and not just a house for the student for the next eight weeks. Well, Greg, I appreciate that. I mean, I honestly uh, am going to be viewing things very differently moving forward. Some of it, as I mentioned, we are going to be forced into coming up with strategies, but I'm also yeah. thinking of ways in which we can start implementing this, having our first resident, some things that we can do with the CI who's spending time with the resident predominantly, um, and how the resident can also add to the overall experience for the other clinical interns. So, uh, I mean, yeah. I appreciate if I take anything, and I'm definitely going to take several things, that's going to be a primary area of focus for me. But um, I do appreciate your time today. I want to give people the opportunity to follow up with you and stay connected with you. What is the best way to accomplish that? Um, they can find me on Twitter like you did. Um, that is at Greg Hartley DPT. So at G-R-E-G-H-A-R-T-L-E-Y DPT, all strung together there. Um, or they can email me at g.hartley at miami.edu. Greg, awesome. Thanks so much for your time today. And okay. I'll definitely be in touch because I'm definitely going to have some questions uh, about things moving forward. But I appreciate you. You're welcome, Josh. This is fun. Thanks.